Hi, I'm Robin Lively, and you're listening to You Might Know Her From with Anne and Damien. Talk that. We're doing it in both years. Damien bought this for me as a little present. We're here in person together. It's October, and he bought me this thing. Oh, okay, I'm behind. We Mine each just, have our own individual. Mine? I, I would say that this is not... The aroma is divine. I haven't got... To, I can't smell it yet. You're hearing some... Open it. Okay, I mine's open. Oh, the, it is a familiar smell, which is so <gasps> interesting. Something I haven't... It's had. rainbow. Mine is multicolored. Okay, let's hear this. Mine? Here we go. Oh, mine is too. How pretty. Folks, do you know what it is? You can't smell it because we don't have smell of vision It's not Halloween candy. No. But if it, if I saw it in a jack-o'-lantern that somebody opened their door and offered it to me, I would choose it in a minute. And guess what? It's fruit by the foot. Oh, my God, babe. Was it hard to find? It's easy to find in a bodega. Bodega? My bodega. Always has like a bin of them. And I always think like, that's funny and never buy them. And today I bought some seltzer for us. And I was like, you know what? Let me buy some. Great purchase. I'm gonna. Thank this is gonna you. be the last bite I take of it, so our listeners don't have to hear my mouth sounds. Folks, hello, welcome to. I would argue my favorite month of mm. the year. Welcome back to. You might know her from with Anne and Damien. What you might hear is little intern of the show, Ronette, as if she is Rapunzel, she is put in the castle, the tower for the night. It was just because she was munching so loudly and I didn't want to take away her her bone. I think she had an antler. It was an antler, yeah. Yeah. I didn't want to take it away from her, so I just put her in her crate, which she's accustomed to going to when nighttime visitors come, as we call them. Um, (laughs) That is how you greet them at the door. Hello, nighttime visitor. So she is accustomed to it, but she's, yeah, she's annoyed. She doesn't like when there's action happening happening and she knows that she's not a part of it she the got- good news is that we ordered sushi it's waiting for us and so we're gonna have it as soon as we stop recording but <laughs> <laughs> truthfully if you are first of all welcome back if you are a longtime listener of this show you know that you know we've been in pandemic times for a long time so it's rare when damien and i get to record in person together and here we are at damien's apartment site uh it's the home of run at the intern obviously you started calling her ronald which i love yeah one of her nicknames so Ronald is here. She's about to be um, released. But in the meantime, we've got sushi on the stove. It's just sitting next to the stove. But we're so glad to be back here with you. Damien said it's October. It's our favorite month of the year. That's 100,000% true. It's always been a very important month for the two of us because I feel like when you met me, we actually like we knew each other for a long time. But there was a year we ended up at Denal, which was our friend Lamore's like yes. friend family restaurant where I she worked and was like that. a meeting place. And you and I had been eyeing each other as friends for a long time, but like we were not close. And that was a year I think that I hadn't dressed up. But it must I have been 2009. It was a long time ago. And you were dressed up as the Travelocity gnome. And you had a paper beard that oh you God. had cut and curled a- yourself. It was like construction paper. Uh-huh. And I thought it was really really ingenious and great and also you just sold it really hard and you were like i'm disappointed in you and you know you were negging me i knew that you yeah, were like mystery That's you the were, way that I flirt yeah you people. neg you neg you were mystery the pickup artist and <laughs> <laughs> i fell for it hook line and sinker but it was a random year where i hadn't dressed up which was not like me at the time and i feel like we were just talking about you have a costume for this year i don't think you're gonna reveal it on this record. I don't think on the record. I'll tell you off the yeah. record. Okay. So I'm debating like what I'm doing for Halloween this year. I've been gone. A lot of people getting married on Halloween. Mm. It's difficult sometimes. It, 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 it complicates the narrative for Halloween plans. 100. But what I realized is that my parents actually got married on Halloween weekend. <gasps> my parents anniversary. Like I never even put it together. I love that. But my parents are October 30th. So I guess it was fated for me that I would have lots of people in my life that would get married on Halloween weekend. So no wedding this October. Well, we're going to do something spooky together that weekend. Yeah. Well, of course, we'll do Witch Fest, which is very important, which we'll get to in a moment. Folks, welcome back to the show. This is our <laughs> our pop culture podcast where we, longtime friends, longtime collaborators, longtime podcast co-hosts and producers, we come together and interview women actors and non-binary performers to talk about 
you know, their work. And also we shoot the shit with each other about all the things we care about. And what do you care about right now? I mean, we're monthly now, so it feels like we walk in here bloated. I feel like I'm, a, it's hard. I'm I know. one of those fish on Twitter that's like, they like someone was like, do you still eat seafood? And it was like someone like, a fish's mouth getting open and then it's like oh pulling God. fish out and someone was like you mean that fish eat other fish because it was like a, a huge fish full of other little fish okay send me these videos I have no idea what I was into about. it I was like this does not make me want to not eat seafood it's like it's just like the fish had like a whole lobster in its oh mouth. I think about I thought you were going to talk to me about like fish that have maggots coming out of them or like fish that are diseased no, no the, okay here's things I care about right now a you know that you and I share a thing, which is that we're very into chiropractor videos mm. as like a comfort, as I a relaxation. Right yeah. You know, my partner has been telling me that her friend who's a doctor said, do not get your neck cracked by a chiropractor because this woman had a stroke <laughs> and died because it cuts off the carotid artery, whatever. I was like, oh my God, I can't hear that because all I want is the neck. i many times by oh, a chiropractor. I just want it. So I've... I'm still seeking comfort in those chiropractic videos. Things that I care about right now, I'm debating whether or not I care about Taylor Swift potentially coming out. Wait, what? Yeah, so you know that this is like Gaylor. Um, yeah, that she was like more bisexual colors in her hair or yeah, some shit. Yeah, and I, like is the album, the album's not out yet. It's coming out at the end of this month. Is that right? I don't even know. I don't even know. I, I've been getting a lot of intel from our friend Katie G. I don't know that I care because Taylor Swift is like not a person that I'm interested in, but I am interested in. Katie G lesbian and <laughs> and Reddit correspondent. She is. She is. If we could like tap into her right now, I would want her to like tap her ear and be like, I'm here with this. Yeah. So. I'm into conspiracy theories. Here's the thing. Like, I, I don't really care about Taylor Swift being gay or not gay or being bisexual or whatever her deal is. I will link out to this conspiracy video that did convince me of something. But I think that Taylor Swift is maybe just trolling all of us. And I don't care enough about her as a person and whether or not she's gay or her music, which doesn't really move me. I'm so sorry for our listeners. If you're Taylor Swift people, if you're Swifties, I don't know that we have a huge contingent of Swifties, do we? I think we? that our audience skews a little... I was going to say older and cooler, but I feel like I don't want to offend anybody. Yeah, you know? that, that's fair. That's fair. There are a significant amount of old people that I think are into Taylor Swift. But anyway, so I'm interested in that. Obviously, you sent us this thing last night, which was Madonna, quote unquote, coming out <laughs> on TikTok. I like I you know, I love Madonna forever. Like I ride or die with I Madonna. Don't know that I love her forever. I do. I do. Like I, I like grew up Rosie, loving Madonna. You know, like that's uh, what I love. Mo yeah. and Roe. OK. Oh, I'm very into Rosie O'Donnell on TikTok. We talked about it last time, so I'm not going to go deep on it here but she admitted to having cellulitis on her face on tiktok <laughs> i just love her so much okay we'll move on from that but really the but madonna, madonna tiktok thing i don't think madonna's gay i don't think she came out i think that she is wasting too much of her life on tiktok i don't know what's happening with her she has children that are still young yes Maybe that's and they're all on, on they're all on tiktok too it's just like i don't understand her life her bathroom is all white like I, then somebody like posted, I saw some tweet or some TikTok. It was like somebody showing pictures of her, like kissing Ingrid Casares and Drew Barrymore and Britney Spears. And I was like, what are you trying to prove? Like, this is not proving anything to me. Well, think, she is on the chart, our chart that we created. Yes. Yes. I think Madonna has had sex with plenty of women. Do I think that Madonna's gay? Absolutely not. Do you think not. she's bisexual? Yeah, maybe. Yeah. I think that Madonna's maybe bisexual. Maybe she's pansexual. Oh yeah. Probably pan. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I'm thinking about lately. Is there anything else I'm thinking about? I still haven't seen Hocus Pocus 2. Did you watch it yet? I didn't watch it yet. Okay. I'm thinking about it. Maybe we'll watch it tonight. I'm No, we have to watch Dancing with the Stars tonight. It's Monday. Yeah. Damien, it's Monday and we've been talking about it and we haven't done it yet. I have to admit to you that I'm delinquent and I have not caught up on Dancing with the Stars. That's okay. I, I know who went home the last two weeks, but I'm excited to watch tonight. I watched... One episode, but I missed an episode, but I know who went home. I think you're going to be okay to jump right in. Okay, perfect. The other thing I just want to mention before we move forward with this October deliciousness is that, of course, Velma's a lesbian. We knew this. We've known this for years. But how do you feel about it? I feel great about it. I mean, didn't we talk to Mindy Cohn, former guest of this show, about because yes. she was the voice for of like ten years, Velma, for a very long time, and she sort of told us that it was like an in joke. But then, like Velma came out, I think after she stopped playing the role and Kate McCucci took over. Maybe I'm missing that name up. And I think that like that was like when Velma first didn't Velma already come out? Am I, think I wrong? In the comics. I think in the comics she came out like. Two years ago. Yeah. So like now she's officially out in another version. Okay. I, Whatever. It's I, like, I, I too mean, many so, universes are confusing. I agree, but I do appreciate that they tried to make Velma gay in the movie, which like we were too old for that movie when it came out, the live uh, action. I saw it with but, my two eldest nieces and I loved it. Okay. Linda Cardellini is 
a hundred percent doing it for me as Velma. I think she's too hot to be Velma, honestly, in the movie. But God, the impersonation is good, and they made her look. Good okay, though. lesbian listeners, queer listeners, people that are attracted to women, are you into Linda Cardellini? Because like for me, Linda Cardellini is. Uh, I'm a little embarrassed to say she's celebrity think, crush, but she's I, Linda I, Cardellini's a celebrity crush. Interesting. I wouldn't have pegged her for you, but I get it now. I I will say that I think she is a queer icon, and here's why. Mm. Freaks and Geeks. Yeah, that the the military Scooby jacket. Doo. Yeah, Scooby Doo. And then Dead to Me. And then Dead to Me. So yeah. tell me all iterations you're attracted to her. Every single one. Because when she wears that military jacket and the sailor pants in Freaks, Freaks and, and Geeks, Geeks, which is not formative for me, but Becky and Baker, yes. But I was like, oh, I'm very drawn to you. And then I didn't care about Scooby-Doo, but I was like, oh my goodness. And then Dead to Me, I really just loved. And I'm excited that there's going to be a season three. We talked to Susie Nakamura about it, and I hope to see like what we're going to get from she said they already filmed it so it was done in the in the in the can that's great i can't wait but it was great to see linda get some queer action in dead to me season two i'm thinking about this because i was thinking about linda cardellini and freaks and geeks i feel like busy phillips to me in that is like the woman i care about Mm. obviously becky and maker but like yeah yeah yeah. i i feel like for me and i'm gonna gonna make a broad statement and say for gay men busy phillips was like the woman we cared about interesting interesting but I think for women who like women and for straight men, they were interested in, what was her name? Kim? I don't know if that's right. No, Kim is busy. Anyway, they were interested in Linda Cardellini. Yeah. What do you think the overlap is? Your partner, Hannah, texted me this the other day about <laughs> what is the, or is the overlap between gay men caring about and lesbians caring about like <gasps> a celebrity? And I, so she had come so to me. So fascinating. It's a great had, topic. She had come to me with Julie Andrews and I said, yes, of course. And I countered it with Olivia Newton-John. I think that's a thousand percent right because Xanadu is so important, Greece is so important, but there's like long standing lesbian rumors with our beloved Olivia Newton John, may she rest. Um, I think Dolly Parton is in the category. Yeah, but I think Dolly Parton's like different, where I think that Julie Andrews and Olivia Newton John were people that we could have been like a, had a crush on, but then also like mm, obsessed okay, with okay, for okay, their okay, talent. Okay, and I think okay. Dolly Parton maybe was not Pam somebody. Anderson, Pam Anderson, top of the list. Our lesbians obsessed. Yes. With Barb Anderson. wire produced by Eileen Chaikin. Yes. That is Pam Anderson is, I think a hundred percent a crossover for lesbians and gay men. Because think about the audience that came to love her so much in Chicago. Think about it. We okay, were there you're for right. It. You're right. You're right. Do you want to hear my controversial third yeah, one? Let's I don't hear know if it's controversial. It. Okay. Jennifer Grey. <gasps> I think lesbians care about her interview. Uh, lesbians think, are very attracted to Jennifer Grey. And I think Grey. that gay men like wanted to be baby. Like they were in lo- I was in love with her. I thought that she was so beautiful. Okay. I think that Dirty Dancing in Greece can and you Sound pull, of Music are formative films. Can you pull films. gay men? Gay let's, men. Gay men. Queer men. Men that are generally attracted to men. Were you interested in Jennifer Grey, Olivia Newton-John, or Julie Andrews, or Pam Anderson when you were a young person? DM me. Ooh. It really is a great topic. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start the list just so that we can keep it cataloged. But folks, here we are. Thank you for bearing with us as we get into the spookiest month of all, the spooky episode of You Might Know Her From. Dear listeners, can you believe that we are in October, the spookiest month, the month where Damien and I and our friend group celebrate Witchfest? And who have we landed for this month's episode? Oh my God. We have to say it together. Robin Robin Lively. Lively. Can you even? Robin Lively has been top of our list since day one. We are so beyond thrilled that we got to talk to her. And we saved this for you for October. Of course we did. Because it is the spookiest season. It is one of our favorite films of all time. If you don't know Teen Witch, first of all, I have to admit something. I didn't grow up with it. It was brought to me by our dear friends, the Teen Witch fandom of Brenna, Alex, and Damien. They brought me Teen Witch. I didn't grow up with it. And it's one of those few movies that like, you know, you watch something and if you didn't grow up with it, you're like, oh, okay, I didn't really get it. It's like, doesn't it doesn't translate. I don't have those fond memories from watching it as a kid with my siblings or like on a rainy day or on a sick day. Teen Witch delivers on every level. So if you haven't seen it, please, God, go get the DVD, stream it wherever you can watch it. It is a perfect film. It's so fun. It's so odd. And Robin Lively is a total star. All of that to say, we were very excited to speak to Robin, not only about Teen Witch, but her entire oeuvre. But, you know, we had to land it here in October because it is Spooktacular Month. So... 
get into it. You might know her from Teen Witch, Into the Dark They Come Knocking, 30 Rock, Cobra Kai, Wildcats, Twin Peaks, Savannah, The Karate Kid Part 3, and Through the Glass Darkly. Well, we are very excited. (laughs) It is a huge day. We are here with actress and I think a bona fide Halloween icon, Robin Lively. Robin, this we feel like this has been a day we've been waiting for. Thank you for being here on You Might Know Her From. Oh, it's my absolute pleasure. (laughs) Thank you for having me. You know, we're big on research here at You Might Know Her From. And, you know, what we started to put together was like you've starred in a number of horror or like horror adjacent projects over the years. So oh. this, in- this includes Ouija, Simon Says, yes. Murder.com, the TV series Light as a Feather, the anthology series Into the Dark, and the Southern Gothic thriller Through the Glass Darkly. So we're going to get to the teen witch of it all eventually, but what okay. do you make of your role in the canon of scary films? Do you like horror movies? No, I don't. <laughs> like, I what, do, <laughs> what do you make of, of, the, of your placement in like this genre? Well, you know, I love being a part of them. I just don't <laughs> necessarily like watching them, you know? Um, I can't. I literally can't. I have to like block everything out and just like look like this, you know, through my... It, I do, I'm, not, I'm not a fan of, of scary movies at all. Um, I don't really think I've been a part of anything too scary. Maybe Ouija was the most scary of all of them that I've been a part of. You're more like thriller and less like, you're not like yes. slasher. Yes. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. I just can't get down with the slasher. It just, I can't, you know, I, it's not, it's just not my thing. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So like one of the things we do is we always try to find out when when our guests have either played like gay or gay adjacent. So we were so excited to discover that you played a small town lesbian in Through the Glass Darkly, yes, which happens to have a lesbian writer and director, Lauren Fash. Yes. So um, was this your first time? Like we do do our research, but was this your first time playing gay? And if so, why did it take so long? And did you do research? Yes. OK, so La- Lauren Fash, by the way, who goes by Fash is has become one of my closest and dearest friends. Just oh, that's I, lovely. And she is so uber talented, and I plan to continue to do more films with her. She's amazing. So this was the first project that actually came my way that I sparked to, and it, it terrified me because I, it's the absolute antithesis of who I am naturally. Like I'm very feminine. I just was like, oh, I don't think I can pull this off believably. I was really I was really scared because, you know, it, it would be horrible to not do the role justice or, or to, to have the gay community go like, oh, my gosh, why did you hire her? Shh, what a joke. You know what I mean? So yeah. I didn't want to do that. But having Lauren be the director and she is gay. So I was like, OK, she's my barometer. If she's buying this, I feel totally safe. I feel confident. Truthfully, I just mimicked her a lot. <laughs> How does she walk? How is she, yeah. you know, um, not really, but, but honestly, like it really was, uh, it was such a, it was such a wonderful opportunity for me. And I loved it so much because I love jumping into roles that scare me and, and roles that are so far from who I am. And there mm-hmm. is such a stretch and I, it just, it's so satisfying at the end of it. The ones that scare me the most are the ones that I embrace wholeheartedly because at the end of the day, when you can do it and you feel proud of it, like that's such a huge accomplishment. So yeah, the movie is very good. And also I read this interview where Fash was saying that she, I don't think she like knew you from teen, Witch or wasn't right. like a lesbian who was obsessed with you from earlier incarnations, but she saw your audition tape and was like, who is that? I don't even want to see the rest of them. Which yes. Is lovely. Yes. And then she, she's so funny when she talks about, about me in interviews because she's like, Oh my, she's like, it's, she never would have cast me. She said, like, if she had known me before, because she's like in between takes, like I would do the take and then I wish she'd call cut and she'd be like, so anyway, and my hands would be so femmy, you know, but, <laughs> but uh, honestly though, I, I like, I had to get like the wardrobe and that was cut my hair and yeah, all the hair, you know, she was like, she didn't want me to cut my hair, but I was like, for me, I have to do it. And, mm-hmm. and I have you're giving to- like full Mayor Whittingham in your hair. Yeah, yes, yes. It was crucial for me because I needed to feel like a different human being. I just loved it. I loved every, 
I just love that experience so much. Yeah, it's very good. It's available right now. Please go watch it. Yeah. yeah please do. Okay, so Robin, it's exciting that like Karate Kid Universe is back in the mainstream thanks to Netflix, the Netflix series Cobra Kai. So for our listeners, if you don't know, of course, Robin starred as Jessica in Karate Kid 3. And when you starred in it, you were 16 and Ralph Macchio was 27. You were originally slated to like be the new love interest, but because you were underage, the role ended up getting rewritten. So the two of you were just friends with like no romantic scenes. Was it wild for you walking into this very successful franchise? And were you more pissed or relieved when you realized you weren't going to have to kiss Ralph Macchio. I was super bummed. Are you kidding? <laughs> My, he was so hot. I know. And I was, I, I was such a huge fan of the, of the movies, like the French. I mean, the first one and the second yeah. one, to be a part of this was so, I, I can't even tell you to say it was a career highlight is such an understatement. And I was just pinching myself throughout the entire process. I could not believe I was in scenes with Daniel LaRusso and Mr. Miyagi. I couldn't believe it. So to be honest, like in any capacity, I was thrilled. I was thrilled. You know, if they wanted us to be friends, I was okay with that. I was just, I thought it was kind of progressive, honestly, revisiting it. I was like, Oh, there's not even like a hint of romance here. I love it. You were like, actually my boyfriend. And he was like, no, let's just be friends. I was like, this is great. This is, this is a new world. It was kind of refreshing, right? Like it was, yeah. it was cool. And, and I, I didn't have any problems with it at all. Right? Yeah. So correct us if we're getting this wrong, but in Cobra Kai, Daniel's character is married to your character's cousin. So you just recently reprised your role as Jessica in season five. You arrive with mac and cheese, which is like the same meal that you made for Daniel in Karate Kid 3. Yes, and then yeah. like a later you get into a little bar fight side by side with Daniel's family. Was it odd to re-enter this universe or was it some sort of like homecoming? So, so wait, correction. The bar fight was actually with Elizabeth Ann Rooney. Right, but you were with the family. Oh, with the family. With Daniel's yeah. family, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. no, of course it was against the evil Elizabeth. Did you, you guys got the connection of the Easter egg of Elizabeth Ann Rooney, right? That she- yes, Okay. Yes. Good. A lot of so people, good. Isn't that great? I love, yeah. I love, I was saying how this show is so satisfying because it's like those Easter eggs of like the mac and cheese. I was like, yes. I, love, I love it. Yes. But Rooney, she kind of slips under the radar for a lot of people. A lot of people didn't quite get that one. So she was a good little Easter egg. <laughs> what did I say? What was the line? I can't even remember. Like stuff it Rooney. I don't remember what I said, but <laughs> good line. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, so uh, back to your question. What was your what was your question? Now I don't remember. Was it that. sort of like was it strange coming back to this like Karate Kid universe, or was it like all, felt like a, some sort of homecoming, or what? What was oh, the feeling? Oh, you guys, it was the best of the best of homecomings of all. Like it was the most epic reunion. I was just screaming all over that set. I was so excited. <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh! every time I turned around. It was Billy, it was Ralph, it was Yuji. I mean, it's <laughs> me and I, you know, Johnny Kapahala. It just was such a fun reunion. And then it was for the people that I didn't know, like Courtney and and Mary and Griffin. They just welcomed me like family. And and the creators were so excited to have me. And it was just like, it, I didn't know what to expect. And I was so excited to be a part of the show. And they were so excited to have me be a part of the show. So it was just like, it was a really special experience. So uh, you were obviously a child star and you worked on a lot of these iconic like child star shows like Punky Brewster, Silver Spoons and Doogie Howser MD. Was there sort of a kinship between you and some of these other young actors or was it sort of super cutthroat because a small community of people were sort of vying for the same roles? No, not cutthroat at all. I didn't experience any of that Mm. anyway, but it was a it was a different world back then in the late 80s and 90s like it was a group of us that we you know there were get-togethers and parties and it was the Corys and it was like Mm. Alyssa Milano and Nicole Eggert and I mean the the list is endless but it was like this core group of us and and we were all friends and um it was really special to be honest like we were all it didn't feel competitive at all and I, I it was a really special time in my life you seem very well adjusted. And I know that's not the course that every like young actor takes, but it's very refreshing. Well, thank you very much. I <laughs> credit my family to that. I don't know how I ended up avoiding so much of the craziness, but I think it has a lot to do with having a stable home environment. So I, I do feel fortunate to have avoided some of the pitfalls and the things that 
there were some scary things that happened to kids on set. And I feel super fortunate to have avoided so many things that you hear about that are just absolutely terrifying that, that could have easily have happened to me. I could have been a victim mm-hmm. of so many horrific things. And I, and I wasn't, cause I was naive. I really was. Yeah. And I was emancipated. I was emancipated at like, how old was I? I think 15 so that I could do, I was so that I could be a lead in a movie and they could work me as an adult. And oh, okay. So was that a hard conversation with your parents or no? no? They, I mean, it was like, Oh, this is business. It wasn't, it wasn't like, Oh, I want to be emancipated from you guys. It was just like, Mm-hmm. If Robin wants to do this movie and be the lead in this movie, then she needs to be emancipated. So it was kind of like a career move. Yeah. So that I didn't have to do the on the onset schooling and the hours and all of that. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, that, yeah. Right, right. It was that angle. It wasn't. Yeah. It didn't have anything to do with my parents. You have know. your children exp- your husband is also an actor. Have your children expressed any interest in the industry? And is that something that you have had conversations with them about? If so, um, you know, <laughs> I, you know, I look, I can't honestly, I can't imagine them not being a part of the industry in some capacity because it's all they know. It's yeah. they've been on so many sets. They've done off camera with us. They've held the boom. They've done movies with us. Like my, my two boys were in a movie with my husband. Our oldest son did a film with my husband. So and now he's doing production work. So, you know, we'll see. But it's never been something that we've, my, my husband and I, we're busy, we're, we're busy enough with our own careers. It's the last thing we would do is like go run our kids to auditions and be on set parents. There's no way. But if it's something they want to do later, absolutely, they can do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, as discussed, you've appeared on nearly every TV series and just like a little laundry list here. Twin Peaks, Chicago Hope, CSI, 30 Rock, The Young Indiana Jones Chronicles, Nip Tuck, X-Files, American Dream, Saving Grace, Cold Case, George and Leo, Criminal Minds, The Rookie, and All Rise, to name a few. That's, not, that's like a good rap. You got like a good rap though, you know? <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> like a beat. You know, Um, top that. (laughs) You most recently (laughs) appeared in Ryan Murphy's Fox series 911 Lone Star, where you play a former barrel racer. What is the hardest part of rolling into a well-established show? And like, who has been your most generous co-star on one of these series that like made you feel really at home? And you can't count your husband, who I think was your fiance on 911. Yes. Wasn't that fun? This is such a great question. So it's always the hardest part is being like the new kid is what I call it. It feels like the new kid syndrome when you're walking onto a set and you're like, hi guys, I'm the new, I'm the new girl. Yeah. I hope you guys like me. <laughs> Everyone has their little cliques and their groups and they're all a family in there. But I've found that for the most part, everyone is generally very welcoming and very kind and gracious and they were all so wonderful on 911 Lone Star. Let me just say that. Absolutely adore everyone on that show. They could not have been nicer. So far, though, like I was very nervous to be on 30 Rock at the time. It was one of the biggest shows. It was a huge yeah. hit. And they were having, let me just put it this way the guest star prior to my episode, I think, was Oprah. The one after me was like Jennifer Aniston. And then there was me. So I was, you know, I could just tell you I was feeling a little anxious about my best spot and how are they going to be? How was Tina? How was Alec? I didn't have any idea. And they were so wonderful. They That was one of my most favorite, most favorite jobs I've ever done. Like that guest spot was like up there. Like not only did I get to wear the Tina Fey's SNL wig, they were so great that I, I go back and I watch that episode and I'm like, Wow, you can tell that I felt so comfortable because I was able to like you can just see it. You can see Yeah, you're having fun. Component. I was having the time of my life and it was because they made me feel so comfortable. They made me mm. feel so welcome. They made me feel so at home that I was able to just do what I do and and do my best. If I had walked onto that set and not feel felt welcomed, it would have it would have affected my performance 100%. And I appreciate them so much for that. They could not have been kinder. In fact, Alec and I, we stayed in touch for years after that. We became very good friends. I haven't talked to him in a long time, but yeah, they were amazing. That episode is so good. 
I guess yeah, I guess it's, it's the reunion episode, which is like an iconic episode already. And then that like it's like Robin Liley also being on it is like is the cherry on in top. a wig, in a wig and French tips. <laughs> One of the writers, so Tina said to me, because I knew you guys, I was like, why am I on this episode? What, what it, it's got to be a teen witch, something it's got to be teen witch related. <laughs> sure enough. One of the writers, producers was a huge Teen Witch fan. Oh and God. Tina says to me after, she's like, oh my gosh, I had to, he, he showed me all of the, the, the top that and the locker room scene. And I had to sit and watch all of it, all of those scenes. I like boys and all. I was like, <laughs> I knew it. You guys, I knew it. I knew it. It had to be a Teen Witch at it all. It's a gift that keeps on giving. It really does. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway. That's great. I appreciate that because it could have, I feel like it could have gone the other way because they are all like comedians, improviser types. Like it could have been very intimidating. It was Matt Hubbard, by the way. I feel like I should give him a shout out. Give him the shout out. Yes. Yeah, it's great. It's like you and Diane Neal, right, from Law & Order SVU, like doing yes. broad comedy. And I just remember being like, this is like the coolest episode because it's like you in a blonde wig and then Diane yes. doing like broad comedy and she's known for doing like hyper series, right. like melodramatic right. Law & Order. Wasn't she funny and she comes with her handbag? <laughs> Love it! She's going to slap her. Oh my it's God. The best. It's so good. It, in fact, I, rumor had it for a little bit that Tina was talking about doing some sort of a spinoff based on our characters. Wouldn't that be the greatest call of my entire life? Could you imagine? Yes, hey, please. Tina's got a show. <laughs> Do you want to be a part of it? Yes and yes. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been amazing. Okay, pivoting to something else very important. Yes. You portrayed Lane. The New York City writer who moves back to Georgia on the Sudsy Aaron spelling nighttime soap Savannah, which whew, at the time was it was like hot. I like had to sneak into it to see seeing it at the time. But it was the WB, the then <laughs> WB's first hour long series and their most successful series to date. And then it was like canceled after t- two seasons. So it was the most successful. It was their most successful after your first season. It was their most successful you- series. Yeah. What? And I, it's still, I don't, I cannot understand. Nobody knows. It's such a mystery why the show was canceled. Well, that was what I was going to ask you. If you could talk about that feeling of being like, you're on a hot show on a yeah. hot, like on a new upcoming network. And then sort of the yeah. rug gets pulled um, out from underneath you. Honestly, I never get too invested in things, to be honest. I mean, mm-hmm. I was out of town. I was away from home. It ran its course. I was okay with it. I yeah. enjoyed every second of it, but it was like, okay, well, it's time to move on, do another something else. So, I mean, I was, I was, I was fine with it. I, but like I said, I, I enjoyed every second of it. I was really happy to be a part of a show. Aaron Spelling is such a legend, and to be able to work with him was so great. I adore him. I, I mean, he did um, obviously nine or two and oh, I, I knew him from then because I was dating Jason Priestley and I actually auditioned for 90210 and tested for it actually got the role of Andrea Zuckerman I'm sure you guys know all this right we were just going there so you're doing great transition work you're You're doing our transition work yeah Yeah. I I could see in your faces that you guys that's where you were going (laughs) (laughs) so we don't have good poker faces but yeah Yeah. so like I would love to hear that story because we read that you had like turned down Andrea Zuckerman I assume because it was like a little bit too similar to like a good girl role? Well, okay. So where I was at, at that point in my life, I was 17. I, I did Teen Witch. I did a Disney show called Teen Angel with Jason mm-hmm. Priestley and Jenny Garth, by the way, mm-hmm. and uh, other roles that were very similar. Where it was just like low self-esteem. These kind of characters that were just, like, yeah. Man. I don't know. I just was like, I didn't want to keep playing that role over and over. And I I felt like I I was continuing to play that same role. And I loved the role of the, of Shannon's role, but it was already offered to, to Shannon Doherty. And Mm -hmm. so I read for Aaron and went back several times and, and they offered that role to me. And I, and I, I did, I turned it down zero regrets because, you know, I feel like your life is, I, I wouldn't be where I am today if I had done that show. So, yeah, I just didn't You may have like become SAG president. That may have been a whole different trajectory. <laughs> yes. 
<laughs> You're absolutely right. I don't know why I made that decision at the time, but I did. Yeah. Well, we were looking at the timeline and maybe this is an incorrect reading of IMDb, but like, did you take on the Twin Peaks role of Lana Milford around that same time in like an effort to avoid getting pigeonholed since it was such a departure from the types of roles like the Andrea Zuckerman types? No, it wasn't that calculated. Uh, yeah. But but that the turn down of, of Andrea Zuckerman role was that was a decision that because I didn't want to be pigeonholed in roles like that, I, I felt like. I really want to place. I want to play something completely different. Like I don't want to keep playing yeah. this type of role. And I'm sure it, had I done that role, it would have evolved into something completely different. I would have made it something different. Right. But I, for whatever reason, it wasn't meant to be mine, and that's why I turned it down. Yeah. And then, um, and then Twin Peaks actually came along about a year after, year and a half after, nine hundred two one zero. You've been really open about the sort of like, yes, I dated Jason Priestley, like from Teen Angel Returns, and then sort of were with him during that stratospheric rise where 90210 became this like insane worldwide cultural phenomenon. Like, yeah. can only imagine how heady and insane and challenging that must have been for like to be young and in love with someone experiencing that. But like, how do you look back on that now? I Meaning, you guys, are you in touch? Like, what does that time feel like for you, like as a, as a much older person? Ugh, well, it feels like a lifetime ago. It does. It feels like a different human being. We mm -hmm. were so young. I, like, I mean, I was, he was my first boyfriend. Well, I had a high school boyfriend, but you know what I mean? Like he was my first yeah. love, I guess you could say. It was a really special time in my life. It was a really crazy time because like who dates someone that ends up being like a mega star like that, you know? Yeah. So it was quite unusual to have had that relationship that was just like private and it was ours. And then it became, we, we couldn't even drive down the street without just mass hysteria happening all around us. So it was weird. It was really weird, but we're friends. We are friends. I mean, not like we talk all the time, but we, yeah, we're friends. We're friendly with each yeah. other. Mm -hmm. The Aaron Spelling connection. Yeah, Aaron Spelling connection. <laughs> okay, Robin, we've got to get into it. We're going to get into, of course, one of our favorite seasonal films. That's 1989's Teen Witch. The film is a bona fide cult classic and Halloween staple. So yeah. bear with us. You, of course, portray Louise, the titular teen witch who discovers her powers right before her 16th birthday with the help of a magical amulet. The movie is like this wild ride that is part rom-com, part teen movie, part musical. So can you tell us like how grueling was the audition process for this film? And did you ever think you'd be talking about it so many years later? No, oh, I, the, the audition process, I don't remember it being grueling whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> I just remember auditioning and feeling really confident about my audition. I couldn't, <laughs> I was very, very impressed with my, my dance moves. <laughs> I, I learned later that Debbie Gibson auditioned. Oh yeah. Okay. I, I just was like, I was kind of oblivious. I would just go in there and do my thing and was happy with whatever I did. And, didn't really put much thought into it beyond that and uh, had no idea that it would end up being this, what it has become today. And so beloved by so many, including myself, because of its impact on people. Like, honestly, it means so much to me. Having social media being what it is now, I can read the impact that it's had on people. And I literally, it brings me to tears, you guys, to tears. Some of the things that I read, I'm like, I thought I was, you know, I was just doing the silly movie. I had no idea that it would have meant so much to people or gotten them through such tragic times. Yeah, it's 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 been the most special uh, project I've ever done, for sure. So there are a handful of musical numbers. Um, I'll name them, you know, for the, the diehards. You know, Top That, I Like Boys, Finest Hour, Never Gonna Be the Same Again, Popular Girl. But D Louise doesn't perform in any of them. I mean, you dance, I guess. Was, was there a musical component to your audition? <laughs> did, did you have to sing for you the know. audition? No, no, no. But I did have to dance. Okay, okay. Quotation. <laughs> hey, You're hey. doing air quotes. I mean, I, I, yeah, I mean, I was, I was dancing for sure. I don't even know what I was doing, but <laughs> you guys, I can't really dance, okay? <laughs> 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 but whatever. I have fun. I enjoy myself. It got me the job, whatever I did, but yeah. not like I'm a skilled dancer. 
Yeah, I like you. Yeah, yeah, you. It's true, though. Like, there are these, like, what? what is it? Are they, are they music videos? Nobody's really singing, but what? It's, it doesn't really further the plot. They are just stitched in beautifully. They are. But top of that does <laughs> advance the plot, I think, because it's like something about Mandy's characters, like confidence. No. Coming into her own. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. Yeah. <laughs> it's a generous read. You guys, we don't question it. We don't yeah, question yeah, yeah. it. We just go it's beautiful. It. Yeah. It's beautiful. It's like one of the things is like the movie takes this really hard turn where there's like this kind of adult and tonally shocking sex scene between yeah. Louise and Brad in between like all of the camp and the music. It's kind of like more adult than the rest of the movie. Yes. At the time, were you like, hmm, what's happening here? Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> Dan Gautier was so hot. First of all, you're saying sex scene, which is like shocking to me because Little innocent little there's bit. open mouth tongue kissing yeah, like, with I, people laying on top of yeah, each other that was what? like more than i expected i didn't interpret that at the time <laughs> young louise here had no idea that that was the implication i thought we were yeah. just having a little makeout session and i was totally fine with it okay i didn't have any i was very young and very naive so i i had no idea that that was what was being implied zero clue clueless <laughs> This was an added scene. I guess they wanted to spice it up a bit. Oh. Okay. Mm-hmm. And that they did. I, I don't think my parents were, were allowed on set that day or something. Okay. I was emancipated. <laughs> so uh, I just was like, oh, cool. Uh, another kissing scene with Dan. Awesome. You know, 16 <laughs> year old me had no problem with that whatsoever. But looking back on it now, you guys, it, it oh, gosh, it is so. I get, I, it's so embarrassing, but you have to understand at the time in the eighties, I mean, look at, look at Karate Kid, the first Karate Kid, that open yeah. mouth kissing scene. Right. I mean, that's just, I mean, I love an open mouth kissing scene, scene. if I'm right? being honest. Yeah. There was like as an a, era where things got chaster in movies totally. and like teen movies were like, what is yes, this? Yes. But, yeah. But that was the way, that was the way you kissed in the eighties in movies. It was, that was the way it went down. I was fast forwarding for those kisses. Like, if ah! I'm being honest. Did you really? Yeah. Now I'm like, when my kids are watching, I'm fast forwarding past them. Like you guys are not watching this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Robin, in your opinion, what is the weirdest part of Teen Witch? Is it your teacher, Shelly Berman, stripping down in class? Is it sitting on Zelda Rubenstein's lap? Is it your little brother's wild vaudevillian performance? Or is it the multiple impromptu raps? <laughs> you guys, I just sound so insane. I love everything you just mentioned. I mean, me too. It's a perfect film. It's a perfect film. <laughs> oh, it's so good. Um, you know, the, the me sitting on her lap, that was that actually happened during rehearsals. Like that wasn't the way it was scripted. It just was so silly. The, and, and we're like, well, we just went with it and put it in the movie because it was ridiculous the way it when, when I tried <laughs> to sit on when she tried to I tried to sit on her lap. It just didn't make any sense. Yeah. Whatever ended up happening. I can't remember. But and I have to say, Richie was the scene stealer of all scene stealers. He had me laughing. How phenomenal was he? Wasn't he so I funny? think about him handing you a newspaper and saying like, I think about it a hundred times a day. It is funny. And like, even in the kitchen, what is he doing? I'm like, all I'm, I'm, all I'm ever doing is watching him. And it, anytime he's in the scene, I'm just watching him. And he's cooking and he's like, yeah, the burnt, <laughs> tarts. But that's a great actor right there. Somebody that can just take nothing and all you want to do is watch them. It is you know wild I mean? and makes me, it is so pleasing to me because it is so crazy. I really enjoy it. He makes choices and like, honestly, I love it. I love an actor yes. who makes choices. Me too. I even forgot what your question was, but we digress. But we're we're going to go through the list of like, the the movie is so full of these like iconic cameos that's specific to like a subset of people which is like i.e. us including the aforementioned Shelley Berman Dick Sargent Marsha Wallace and of course Zelda Rubenstein did you know at the time that the casting of these people was campy and like what was the best story of that group of elders from oh. that time well the only the oh boy I know I had no idea I was so young I didn't know I didn't know really who anybody was at the time Shelly Berman was kind of a big deal. I didn't know. It was pretty funny, though, because, like, I remember the scene where he had to kind of, like, hit the 
hit the desk with his, you know, with his ruler and I had to get really sad. And he wasn't there for that for, for my off camera because he went back to his trailer. Thank <laughs> Didn't do coverage. Yeah, no, he wasn't there. He was like, I'm going to be in my trailer. Just took off. I was like, okay. Cool shell. Yeah. But as far as that, and Marsha was amazing. Uh, she was so wonderful. Thank goodness, because I had some really, you know, special scenes with her. Dick Sargent was great. I, I can't say enough wonderful things about everyone. They were just, but Mandy and Dan and all of it, we had such, we had such great chemistry and such wonderful friendship between us. It was such a special movie. And I think so much of that hinges on your chemistry with your fellow actors. And none of us had a clue what we were doing or what we were making that it was going to resonate with people the way that it did it would become this like crazy cult classic and i remember like years ago it was like the first midnight screening that i was going to and i was like this is gonna what if what if no one shows up this is strange a midnight screening and i was blown away because people were like dressed up like louise they knew all of the songs and, the, and i was like i don't even know the movie this was a long time ago it was crazy, you guys. It was like they were treating me like I was a rock star. And I I had no idea at the time that it had this kind of a following. So that was pretty cool. It's our generation's yeah. Rocky Horror. I said it here. Yeah. <laughs> it really is. It has like this Seriously. whole other life. It really does. We spoke to Jo Beth Williams on this show last year because she, of course, starred in Poltergeist with Zelda. And she mm-hmm. told us that mm-hmm. Zelda always had hot, six five boyfriends on the set every week you must have spent a lot of time with her on the set of team which did you witness any of this no i did not i was very into finding out that she, Are had, you like, serious? she was like into yeah. like a tall very tall man what well i would have loved to have heard like the inside scoop with like was she flirting with the guy who was the prince you know <laughs> right. I didn't hear anything like that. So I didn't know. I didn't know any of that. That's so funny. So as Damien mentioned, we watch Teen Witch every year with our friends and have long speculated that Rita Wilson is a featured dancer in I Like Boys. She was listed on the IMDb. <laughs> she has denied it. Can you oh. confirm this for I us? Mean, because was- Mandy was like, no, it's not her. And it's like, Rita Wilson was like, no, but like, it looks exactly well, like Rita Well, if it Wilson. was, if she, if she said it wasn't her, then I'm going to have to assume <laughs> that it wasn't. It's fair. But, it's fair. You know, it's fair. I will say that when we were doing the, when it was Dan, Mandy, and, and, and Josh and I were doing the, the voiceover for the Blu-ray edition, we were all like, wait, is that, is it Rita? Is it not? We were trying okay. to figure it out. We thought it was her. But if she's saying it's not her, then I have to imagine it's not her. I respect that. Yeah, I don't know. She finally responded to one of our tweets one year and was like, it's not me. And we said, all right, we're going to keep <laughs> really, we're going to keep. She must be asked all the time. That's so funny. <laughs> she is listed on the IMDb or was for a long time. That's so crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we have a, no idea. I guess it's not her. Right. Okay, Robin Lively, we are moving into the part of the show that we call Rapid Fire. This is so we can get everything else out okay. that we need to get in before we part ways. Okay. It's Rapid Fire for me and Anne because we are just going to be a little more maniacal, but you can take your time if you need to. Okay, great. One of your first feature film credits is in the 1986 sports comedy Wildcats, where Goldie Hawn coaches a men's football team. Goldie plays your mother, Swoosie Kurtz plays your aunt, and Jan Hooks portrays your stepmother. You were only 14 years old at the time. Did you take any lessons away from those funny women? I was 13, by the way. Not that it really matters. No, I, I mean, I, well, for the record. For the record. <laughs> those women were iconic to me. Goldie Hawn set the standard for how you should behave on mm. set, how you should treat mm. others. And she was so warm and lovely. And she made such a mark on me and in my life. And um, I adored her beyond. She was everything that you would hope that she would be. And then some. And, you know, I was so young and impressionable. So having her example, she, like I said, she made her mark. And, and I, remembered, I remembered that. I never forgot how she made me feel. And I carried that on, you know, in my life. And I've I've certainly now made those transitions from teenager to to adult, and I've played the mother. So it's like I remember those things, and I and I've made sure to to return those feelings to others. She's a star. Yeah, I appreciate sure. that. She is. Yeah. 
You've been a part of a number of cult favorites like Twin Peaks and Teen Witch. Can you say of those two, which fan base provides for a, let's say, more intense fan encounter? Oh, Teen Witch, of course, hands down. <laughs> Teen Witch okay. is like takes the cake, always. Do people like cry when they see you? Like, is it like an intense, like, do you get like really intense energy if people see you on the street? Yes, yes. It's never like, <laughs> oh, hey, oh, hey, right. you're from Teen Witch. It's always the intense energy, like, oh my, oh, you have no idea, you know, that kind of a thing. And yeah. I think I've mentioned in several interviews how there was one San Francisco screening, midnight screening with Peaches Christ that changed everything for me years and years ago. I was probably like literally 18 years ago. And I was just like, oh, this is so fun. I'm having the best time. And then this one young guy comes up to me and he like takes me by the hand. He's like brimming with tears and he holds me by the hands and he's like, you have no idea how much you changed my life. You changed my life. And it was that moment where I was like, I mean, literally like gutted me. And I was like, huh? And and then it was that point at that moment too the teen which just became so much more important to me. Yeah. And that's my special story. <laughs> was it always that way or was it was there a time period where you were like, I don't need to associate never. With this? Like, like never. Never, okay. never, never, never. It was always like, Oh, this is fun. This is a fun movie. Oh, this is so sweet. But then it took a turn where it was like, Oh, this actually is a special movie. This is yeah. actually meaningful to people. I mean, sure, it's campy and fun for a lot of it, a lot of people, but for some, it actually was very meaningful in a way that, like, like I said to you, it makes me cry. Yeah. But it's also like bubblegum camp too, you know, where you can just like watch it over and over, and it just never gets old. <laughs> so good. We're almost due for our screening. We are. Yeah. So you get to ride a horse and shoot a gun in the 1987 Western romp for kids, Buckeye and Blue. But you were basically the only girl in the cast. You were probably like 15 and the rest of the cast is like 30-year-old men. Yes. What was the vibe? Was it traumatizing? Was it cool? Like, what was that situation? Super, super cool. I don't really ever meet strangers. I end up making friends with basically everybody. They were like my brothers, you guys. They became my family. I adored <laughs> them. They were kind and wonderful. And that was the movie that I ended up getting emancipated for, just FYI. Okay. Because I was in like every scene and I couldn't possibly have done that film and also taken the time to do the schooling. So I was 14. My dad played my dad in the movie. It was a really special film. I loved it. I loved it. Robin, you recently played a dying slash dead mom in the Hulu horror anthology series Into the Dark. They come knocking. In one scary scene, you get to wear like a bald cap and you do like a fully grotesque, creepy crawling thing across the floor. Yes. What was more terrifying? Your ghastly bald cap and sunken eyes or ah. or the imaginary <laughs> Ewok gremlin-like creature Fuzz Bucket from the <gasps> 1986 Disney film of the same name? What was creepier? <laughs> I guess I should ask you that because I think you're going to say fuzz bucket. Terrifying. I'm into really fuzz terrifying. bucket and is terrified of fuzz bucket. <laughs> fuzz bucket. You guys, I have to tell you though something a, a fun a fun little tidbit about that Hulu thing. So when I I loved that I loved all of the uh, special effects makeup it was the coolest. It was cool. It was cool so, to see you like that. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I haven't seen you do that before. You guys, see that kind of stuff. I am so down for. I loved it. When when I had that scene coming up the next day, I was like, okay, she did well. I was I, it was in the, it was supposed to be in this container. I'm supposed to come at her. Like, how can I do that? Where it'll be really scary. Walk. I'm supposed to walk up to her. That's not scary. So I actually came up with the crawling thing. I was Very in scary. my closet <laughs> and I'm like, trying to figure it out. What would be creepy? What would be scary? <laughs> and I'm literally on all fours. I'm like, Ooh, that's kind of creepy. Oh, that's kind of, that's scary. So I did it for the director and he was like, yes, let's do that. Let's definitely do that. <laughs> so it was great. The whole thing was really great. I think that whole anthology series is really good. We've seen a couple of the other yeah. iterations, but this one was really great. Also like kind of sweet and about grief, but also creepy. Right. Adam yeah. Mason did a great job directing and Clayne Crawford, he and I worked together a gazillion years ago in um, 
<laughs> Some cheesy movie. What was it called? Seven Ten Split, you guys. Oh my gosh! I saw the trailer for Seven Ten Split. It. it looked it looked like there were a lot of like breasts. I mean, that guys, was that was what I saw. It was like two bowling balls in front of. Yes. I mean yes. I, we were like, this can't be the thing that Robin probably wants to talk about. We'll move to other. Yeah, I never saw it. Ray Wise, okay. Ray Wise was in it with me also, and Ray yeah. and I ended up. We worked together in so he's many. A, he's on Savannah with you, right? Yes, we have done countless things together. We were in Psych. I can't even remember another movie that I don't remember the name of. We <laughs> it's like we worked together all the time. He's great. <laughs> he is amazing. He's amazing. Did you get to meet Fuzz Bucket, by the way? Because I realized I don't think you guys had scenes <laughs> together. But then I was like, I'm sure that I'm sorry we're bringing up Fuzz Bucket again. But Damien and I did not know about it uh, until we started our research. And we were like, this is so specific. Yes, I I did get to meet Fuzz Bucket. Yes. Yes, I did. I love practical <laughs> effects. I was like, oh, that's like a person yeah. in a costume, which is like, it's, just, it's like wildly different than the way they make things now. Yes. Right. I prefer it. That was a long time ago. (laughs) I mean, I had to have been like 12 or something, I think. It's on Disney Plus. It's available. Is it really? Yeah. It's like a good, it's like the best quality you can find on Disney Plus. Are you serious? You better get some fucking residual for Fuzz Bucket. I really should. (laughs) Yeah. People seem to love, which you haven't asked me about, uh, Not Quite Human. Oh my God. You were just talking about that, Damien. Yeah. Easy about Not Quite Human. That's not available on Disney Plus, though, because I was like, I remember this from being a kid and I was trying to find it. And I was like, I can't watch it. Oh, but that's like the cyborg, right? Like the robot, like he, you're yes. like you're in love with or he's like your high school, whatever. No, he was my brother. I was the sister. Uh, um, you're not the love interest. Okay. OK, OK. Yeah. He was the boy who could fly. Alan Thicke was my father. Oh, right, 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 right. Yes. Love Alan Thicke. And there was it was not quite human one, not quite human two. It was a whole thing. People love it. Do you think that like that. that like not quite human or Teen Witch or like any of these properties will like like is it weird to you that they haven't re- tried to reboot Teen Witch like that's something can you do that do you own, well, can you get the is it a long story? We it was almost it was it mm. was about to happen and then it just it's gonna happen I'm not eventually. Up. I'm not giving up. I, no, I'm it's, like, it's yeah, gonna happen because it's like it everybody just loves to recycle IP, and it's like to me, it was such an underrated gem that to me, like, yeah, you would feel it. fresh. A lot of people wouldn't be familiar with it. The people that are gonna be diehard for it. We yeah. just have to, We just didn't have the right voice. We didn't have the right voice, and it, and because of it, it just didn't. You know, it just. You gotta get Tina Fey and Matt Hubbard on board. That's what I'm saying. Okay. Actually, you know we should maybe call him. Matt Hubbard. You need a- I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reach out to Matt again. <laughs> That's a busy, successful guy, okay? But Matt loves TV. He can make time, he can make time for you. Okay, please. he should. Yeah. Robin, between Savannah and Jason Priestley, as you said, you spent some time with Mr. Aaron Spelling, and we assume that that's probably also in that iconic house. Did you ever happen to see Candy Spelling's infamous wrapping room, which was exclusively for wrapping presents? Please tell us whatever you can, everything, etc. Oh, I wish I had something to <laughs> tell you about the wrapping room. The two things that I can tell you about this Aaron Spelling house that, that, that made an impression on me were the uh, the the bowling alley that was super cool he had a bowling alley in the house that was awesome and then there was a room i believe it was the dining room where he made this specifically so that you could hear it was this huge table and he made it so that the ceiling was domed so that if you were on this end and you're on the opposite end you could hear literally like you it was us it was like surround sound so if you were talking on this end of the table you ever hear it? You could hear like that. It was the coolest. He thought of the acoustics of the dining yes, room. Yes, and he is... actually, and he was the one to demonstrate it for me, which was even cooler. I just, I love the old school vibes of Aaron yeah. Spelling, and it sounds like maybe he wasn't, you know, he seemed like a decent enough person. He's so great. I have yeah. nothing but wonderful things to say about him, wonderful yeah. memories of him. He was the real deal. Like, he was very invested in... In, in all aspects of the show. And, and that's why I think he had such success. Like he wasn't, you know, pawning the jobs off on other people. He was very involved in the casting process. And you could tell, like, even when I was in the room reading, 
I could tell how much he was like invested in my read and me as a person and um, like in Savannah and we would, you know, the girls and I read for him and like, I just don't, I, even like with our, our, we had these Vera Wang gowns for, for the pilot and he wanted to be a part of the look and all of it. So he was very creative yeah. and quite a genius, I have to say. I miss that sort of like crazy tycoon energy in Hollywood. Yeah. Like, it's like there was something that, golden right? age. Yeah. Yeah. Well, because now everything is, you know, you, you get cast off of a tape now. You don't even meet people anymore. Yeah. It's like you're an audition on tape and you're cast and then you're, there's no more like going into a room and meeting people. It's just, it's non-existent, which is kind of sad. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Robin Lively, last and very important question. Okay. You appear in the iconic high school reunion episode of 30 Rock, as mentioned. Mm-hmm. You cover your famous red hair with a short, choppy blonde wig, which we've never seen you do. Right. So, Robin Lively, which of these famous redheads would you say could top that? Carrot Top, Chucky the Doll, Ed Sheeran, Jessica Rabbit, Yosemite Sam, or Bryce Dallas Howard? Um, Jessica Rabbit. <laughs> My, yeah, Jessica Rabbit. Jessica Rabbit, it's a tentative but final answer. <laughs> they, yes. I was, You're I, like, I, thank you for going with us on that journey I was where we got Yosemite Sam I'm in like the red head list. Yeah. <laughs> Robin Lively, thank you so much. This has been such a delight. You guys are delightful. One of the thrilling things about this show is getting to just like unlock an entire career from someone who you know for like something specific maybe, which of course we knew Robin from Teen Witch, which we were obsessed with, but I'm um, getting to see all of her work and she's been working since she was a child. She was a child star. She was in Karate Kid th- Part 3, which I was very into like the idea that this character then suddenly became a platonic relationship, kind of feels progressive in some way. But of course, she's from like a showbiz family. Her mom was a talent agent. Blake Lively is obviously her younger sister. Her brother was in The L Word, which we had a question for, but we scratched for time. But yes, we know that Eric Lively played, oh my God, I can't remember. Jenny and Shane's roommate. Jenny and Shane's roommate, roommate, roommate but I like can't say his name. Them. Yeah, he videotapes him in season oh, two. Oh, Eric is her brother's name. Yeah, Eric. yeah, yeah. Um, I'm saying I can't remember the character's name, but it doesn't matter. He is great and wonderful. Anyway, it's just like, it was amazing to talk to her about being emancipated from her family and whether or not she would let her kids, because she's married to Bart Johnson, who's an actor, and whether or not they would let their kids be in the business. And she was kind of like, I think it's sort of like a foregone conclusion, but we're never going to like run them to auditions. But also just to like, we know her from Teen Witch and I know her from 30 Rock, but then getting to unlock all of this other work, like the creepy crawly thing that she's playing in They Come Knocking to like, you know, the butch lesbian that she's playing in Through the glass darkly it is truly the thing that like it gives me i don't what is the word i'm looking it for it puts you up yeah like it just makes me so excited like yeah she's so fucking good and yeah. i was like i'm so happy we did this interview because i was able to find things that i never would have and you know that that 30 rock writer producer was like really into her and into yeah. teen witch and it's like hello it's weird to me that Teen Witch has not yet been rebooted. I know yes. they were working on a version with Ashley Tisdale for a moment, like 10 plus years ago. But it is weird to me, like Robin should be in that and it should be happening a lickety split. It's such a good, it's such a good property. And like, I am so now beholden to and like hold in high esteem, the original that whatever they do, I would be worried that they would fuck it up. Totally, totally, totally. Um, but I'm all for it, especially if it gets Mandy and Dan and Robin, all the residuals. And Rita Wilson. And Rita Wilson. Oh, God. God love Rita. I mean, Robin really went on the ride with us. Uh, <laughs> I appreciate. We will be... Tweeting at Rita Wilson. Every year, every October. It's like in like a week. You guys will have already heard this or maybe just be listening to it. We'll currently be tweeting at Rita Wilson. Yeah. She will once again be ignoring us. Yes. And she did respond once and we haven't received a cease and desist yet. So we will keep going until we get that. But honestly, if you haven't seen Teen Witch, please go watch it. Um, let us know what other spooky movies that you're watching. I just like, I can't believe that we finally got Robin Lively for this podcast. And I have to say just quickly that one of the things that you were saying about unearthing somebody's oeuvre and going through and like learning where they got their start. 
I didn't know how much I cared or needed to know about Aaron Spelling until I went back and like looked at Savannah <laughs> and Robin Lively's whole early career. And I just am fascinated and I cannot stop thinking about Aaron Spelling and Candy for that matter. And I love Tori. Mm-hmm. I just, I feel like there's much to uncover there. And I just want to th- plant this seed. If there should be a movie made about Aaron Spelling's life and who should play him. I have to think about it. I don't Randy. have an answer. <laughs> Randy was on that you know, soap you know. opera. If you know, you okay, know. But Randy was on that soap passions, opera. Right? No, no. It was like Passions, but it was like on a boat. Do you, no. Is this wrong? It was like a hotel. I'm, it must have been Aaron, an Aaron Spelling It show. was an Aaron Spelling joint for sure. But do you, it was a, it was, it was maybe before Passions. He may have also been on Passions, but it was like a hotel or a Malibu Shores. Malibu Shores. I don't even know if I was right on any of those fronts, but I can see Randy Spelling's face in that promo to this day. Was he wearing like one of those suits that doesn't have a collar? Oh God, I love him. Oh, I love him. I love the spellings. Yeah. What were you just saying the other day about like, we don't have Aaron Spelling nowadays. I said, Ryan Murphy is not Aaron Spelling enough because like he's the closest we got and it's not good enough. Give me more mogul. Give me more of like, I created a dining room that's 700 square feet (laughs) and I catered the acoustics so that you could hear from one end of the 700 foot table to the other. These are the details we received. Could never, could never, Uh, you know? Yeah. You know, folks sometimes will say, like, you don't really, like, watch all the things you're talking to your guests about. Like, <laughs> there's no way. And I'm like, babe, we find a way. And I rewatched the first two episodes of Savannah to, like, refresh my mem. And Aaron Spelling does, like, a fireside chat at the beginning. <laughs> be like, hello, welcome to the WB. Like, tonight you're going to be watching. And I was like, oh, my God. Imagine, to Anne's brilliant point, like, imagine Ryan Murphy, like, being so... I think he would be... It's like Masterpiece Theater. Yes. Introduce your fucking joint, Ryan Murphy. Have the gall to do it. Yeah, I was just so thrilled. That's what Tom Cruise did at the beginning of Top Gun Maverick, for fuck's sake. Tom Cruise is more Aaron Spelling than Ryan Murphy. This is the world that I want to live in. I just want to leave you with one note about Robin Lively, which is please revisit her work in the brilliantly undiscovered hit by me, Fuzzbucket. You were talking about, did we actually watch? Yes, I did watch Fuzzbucket. <laughs> it's on Disney Plus, and it is fully available for you to watch. Fuzzbucket looks like a combination of, what did you say, Damien? Like uh, an Ewok, and I said Rumpelstiltskin <laughs> with Amy Irving. <laughs> That live action Rumble Stiltskin. I think I, you know, I just came to you now. Like, did you ever watch Land of the Lost? But the re, the, the one that no, they made in the nineties. No, it creeped me out. But yes, I know. What There's the, like I know a little what, like yes. chimpanzee man, yes. and I in Fuzzbucket yes. like looks like him, but smaller. And I have to literally, say that, I retweeted your tweet. No comments. <laughs> nobody's seen Fuzzbucket. I want Fuzzbucketers to come out. In if you're a Fuzzbucket, if you remember Fuzzbucket, look at a picture of him. And DM us right now. We need to know. Right now. Say, hey, I just heard this on about Fuzzbucket and I wanted to let you know. Stop in your commute, pull over, be safe. Just say, I know about Fuzzbucket. I know. Bucket. We need to know. Robin Lively, thank you for making sure we knew about Fuzzbucket. Oh, we are so grateful to have had Robin Lively on our show. Folks, if you're not familiar with what Fuzzbucket looks like, you should follow us both on social media because that's where you can find that information. You can follow us each on every medium at Damien Bellino. That's D A M I A. N Bellino B E L L I N O. Please spell his name right. Can you just please? It hurts. It hurts bad when you spell it with an E. And I am Rodeman on all mediums. That's R O D E M A N N E. You might know her from it's produced by us. That is my beautiful, tall and strong friend, Ian Rodeman, and me, weak and small and short, <laughs> Damian Bellino. We also want to thank our consultants at Grumpy Entertainment. We love them. That is Jason Jude Hill and Daniel Sears. They keep us going. They keep us motivated. They keep us ambitious. They keep us creative. We are so appreciative of them. And also, all of that like squeaky clean editing you're listening to right this very minute is Daniel Sears. And I'm going to guarantee, I'm, I know for a fact we just messed up before this, so thank you, Daniel, for all of that crisp and pristine editing. Damien likes to underplay his strength, but I know that he can pick me up to this day. He's very strong, and I'm going to prove it when you pick me up as soon as we finish recording. If you like the music that you hear on each and every episode of You Might Know Her From, it's because it's Gang, baby. Special thanks to Gang, who provides all the music for each and every episode. You can download and listen to Gang wherever you find your tunes. If you need to see that 
clip of Aaron Spelling talking about Savannah in a fireside chat. Guess where you're going to find it? The show notes, babe. I spend a lot of time and energy making sure that I catalog each and every moment that we discuss on this podcast in the show notes so that we can find it, so that you can find it, so that you can have a treasure trove of clips just like us. We're both drunk. we just fucking slurring our words. <laughs> 45 minutes later, the food is cold. The sushi is still by the stove. <laughs> Folks, we'll be back here every month. November. We'll see you in November. Happy November. Home for Purim. <laughs>